from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Pam Jackson. I'm director for the Center for the Book here at the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's Books and Beyond talk, and thank you so much for being with us. Um, we at the Center for the Book are part of the National and International Outreach Unit of the Library of Congress, and it's our mission here at the library as the nation's first cultural institution to provide a rich, enduring source of knowledge, one that can be relied upon for endeavoring, endeavoring intellectually and creatively, and that's definitely what our author has done with his project today, so we're excited to talk about that project shortly. At the Center for the Book, we promote reading and literacy, books and libraries, poetry and literature, and we do so to, to promote and sustain informed and engaged societies, knowing that they're the best defenders of democracy. And we hold that as our mission and have talks like these for the purpose of engaging one another and, and sharing ideas and points of views that may be ones that we don't always have access to. So we like to have um, the opportunity for unique and interesting discussions and um, access to diverse knowledge and uh, research. And we have that with, with uh, today's author as well. Uh, our mission at the Center for the Book is carried out nationwide. We have a Center for the Book in every state, including the, and the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands. <laughs> And we also administer the Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program, which allows us to have a national and international network of uh, partners and organizations around the world who are promoting reading and literacy in very innovative and interesting ways, which helps us fulfill on what we're here to do at the Library of Congress. Um, just quick housekeeping before we get started, if you take a moment to make sure your devices are on silent or vibrate, uh, and that is in part so that it isn't a distraction for our speaker today, but also uh, we are recording today's event, so um, the webcast is uh, will be available online, and you can visit our um, webcasts at read.gov. Uh, please also know that if uh, during the Q&A portion you are asking questions, you are recorded and part of our recording, so please know that. And then uh, finally, one uh, item to mention as we uh, begin, the, the author will make a presentation today. As I mentioned, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer after that, and then his uh, book is available for signing out in the lobby at the end of our hour talk this um, afternoon. So the chief criterion for the Books and Beyond series is that the books that we share about here are um, either about the Library of Congress or published by the Library of Congress or researched here at the Library of Congress. And uh, using our collections, most of the maps in the book that we'll um, learn about today are from the library's collections. And today's author has published the book in partnership with the Library of Congress Publishing Office. So we're very excited about the project. And here is uh, Stephen Hornsby. He's the director of the Canadian American Center and a professor of geography and Canadian Studies at the University of Maine. He's the author and co-editor of several books, including the prize-winning historical Atlas of Maine. So his new book, Picturing America, um, and I have it, The Golden Age of Pictorial Maps, which is lavishly illustrated and available, as I mentioned, for sale out front. And the note I saw in it that there were more than 150 pictorial jewels in this book. <laughs> so we're very excited to see some of them in today's presentation. Please welcome Stephen Hornsby. Well, thank you, Pam, for that very kind introduction. And thank you for all... Uh, to all of you for coming uh, today, giving up your lunch break to uh, hear something about pictorial maps, uh, a passion of mine, as you will see. Um, before I get started, I really do want to recognize and reiterate what Pam has said about the central importance of the Library of Congress. This project and the resulting book simply could not have happened without the Library of Congress. It began with a chance and fortuitous meeting with Ralph Ehrenberg, Chief of Geography and Map Division, I was just starting the project, met Ralph, and right from the word go, he was supportive. 
and put me in touch with the publishing office, with uh, Peggy Wagner, delighted to see her to here today, who was, uh, I'm sure those of you who know Peggy will know that she's extremely enthusiastic and she really uh, ran with this project and gave me all the support that I could wish for. And Susan Rayburn, also of the uh, publishing office, was a, a delight to work with during um, the uh, copy editing of the, the manuscript and helping in, in other ways as well. Uh, Pam mentioned that this is a uh, co-publication uh, with the University of Chicago Press and I want to recognize also Mary Lauer who was the editor I worked with and it was uh, a very pleasant uh, experience. In fact for an author uh, this project went remarkably smoothly and quickly so hence the big grin on my face. Uh, it's been a, a, a joy to, to put together. Well like many things in life um, the origins of this project and book really go back to my childhood, as so many things do in one's life. And um, when I was very young, I spent about a year with my family in the island of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. And uh, my mother, who was a teacher, had this map by uh, the English graphic artist Macdonald Gill, and she, I think, used it in classrooms, hence it's rather battered appearance and the map kicked around our house for many years and is now in my uh, my uh, collection of pictorial maps and I think it was this map that really sparked my interest and I should say that many pictorial maps were created for children in an educational role as we shall see in a minute and this map with the elephants the galleons the sun the jungle uh, sparked my imagination but uh, we grow up, of course, and I went off to school and was interested in geography and went through the English school system and then a university in Scotland. And it was quite clear that if you're going to be a professional geographer, uh, one could not take such maps as this uh, seriously. What one had to focus on was a scientific map in England, the Ordnance Survey one inch to one mile map. Here in the United States, it would be the USGS topographic quad, which may be familiar to you. Of course, the younger members of the audience know nothing about such paper maps because they find all their cartography off the internet, particularly Google Maps. But in the old days, when we looked at paper maps, it would be the USGS quads here and the Ordnance Survey topo maps in the UK. Um, and it was not until much later in uh, my career when I was involved co-editing and contributing to the historical atlas of Maine, which has been mentioned, that I began to think uh, again about the use of pictorial imagery in cartography. Uh, the atlas is in many ways a standard cartographic production, produce, uh, uh, presenting information in a very objective way. Um, which can get a bit tedious, map after map of uh, sort of bar graphs and pie charts and so forth and proportional circles. And so I try to leaven the graphic imagery by bringing in pictorial elements. And one of the maps that we did this was on uh, Portland, Maine, uh, the land use of Portland, Maine. I'm not going to get into the sort of triangle that you can see here, but just draw your attention to the um, the images of buildings around the central graphic. Uh, these were from a map published, I think, in the, in the 1840s or 1850. And we had them digitally removed and scattered around on this map to try and give a sort of three-dimensional sense to the, uh, the Portland uh, landscape. And then almost one of the last maps I was working on for the Atlas was tourism and thought about tourist maps, and these are often pictorial. And so we've got two examples here. Uh, uh, one on the right is a, a gas map from, I think, the 1940s. The one on the left is a, um, an artistic map that was produced, um, a series of state maps, in fact, for the country. Um, and it was while bringing these maps, uh, researching these maps, and putting them in the atlas, and that got me interested in um, graphic presentation and the way different types of information are presented. USGS and Ordnance Survey maps do 
certain things very well, but other things they don't do. And pictorial maps are excellent at presenting perhaps softer, more cultural features, such as landscape, uh, history, uh, memory, uh, emotion. Uh, many pictorial maps are great fun. They have humor in them. Um, they show pride of place or pride of state or pride of region. Uh, and they also show that rather nebulous sense of place, which is often talked about, particularly in literature and art. And it's that cultural sense of particular places and states and regions that I think pictorial maps present so well. And these kind of cultural elements just were not being captured in the uh, uh, USGS topo maps. So I began to think about this, and particularly having worked so closely on this atlas for more than a decade, about how we convey information, pictorial graphic information, to uh, the reader. And once the atlas was finished, uh, I was somewhat intellectually exhausted and thought, I really need to do something fun. And uh, it seemed that pictorial maps was an obvious outlet uh, and a sort of a uh, recreational project almost. And when I started to look into it, I realized that you no know, scholars had, had looked at it. It had simply not been treated seriously at all. There were maybe one article, I think, or one or two articles about the genre of pictorial maps. So I thought, uh, this is excellent. Uh, there's a big gap here in, our, in the literature and our uh, cartographic knowledge. I'm going to explore the topic. And um, that led me course here to the Library of uh, Congress. Now pictorial images on maps are not a phenomenon of 20th century America. They go right back to medieval Mapa Mundi um, and through the great age of uh, Dutch cartography as shown here this map by Lynn Schoten uh, and you can see galleons and various beasts I think in Africa and the very elaborate uh, title and and cartouche with the inset of the islands um, uh, below. So not a new phenomenon, but um, the pictorial elements start to drop out through the 18th century with the Enlightenment and a push towards a more scientific type of cartography. Um, there is a revival, particularly here in the United States in the late 19th century and early 20th century with the rise of uh, bird's eye views, and the United States was really a, a great producer of bird's eye views of towns and cities. And here we have a map from the early 1920s, which is a bird's eye view of Fresno County, uh, amid California's Garden of the Sun, which is called a pictorial map. And I think you can start to see a bit of a shift from the sort of classic bird's eye into a, a more consciously pictorial uh, map. And you can see around the borders these various photographs and um, artistic renderings of uh, um, the Sierras and uh, Yosemite. Perhaps the greatest influence on the genre uh, actually comes from the UK. And it's the map on the left, again done by Macdonald Gill. Um, it's the Wonderground map of London. It was produced in 1914 uh, for the London Underground. Frank Pick, a very innovative uh, general manager of the London Underground, wanted to publicize the system and hired various artists to produce maps. And among them was Macdonald Gill, who produced this spectacular map that was put up in underground railway stations and then was produced for retail to the general public. It was so popular. So this is 1914, the beginnings of the, uh, the First World War, at least in Europe. Um, and it must have come across to the United States uh, in the late teens, early 20s, because the map on the right is by two American commercial artists, Olson and Blake, who were based in Boston. And this is a map of Boston. Uh, published by Houghton Mifflin, again a Boston publishing uh, firm, a uh, very famous firm, and it shows Boston. And I think by pairing them, you can see the 
really the direct influence from Macdonald Gill across the Atlantic to this map of Boston and the way the, the map is created. Uh, I think the yellow roads is a dead giveaway. Uh, Blake and Olson denied or, or said they had not looked at other uh, artistic maps, but I think they must have known uh, Macdonald Gill maps. And certainly Gill's map was being retailed over here by the 1930s. I found advertisements for Gill's map, but I suspect the copies were circulating uh, here uh, earlier. So that is a, a, an influence. Bird's eye views are an influence. And then um, 1925 is the great exposition in Paris uh, that becomes known as Art Deco. And Art Deco comes across the Atlantic to the United States and really influences everything from jewelry to skyscrapers. Think of the great Manhattan skyscrapers, many of them Art Deco pieces of architecture. And it comes into the graphic arts. This is just a publicity um, folder for uh, Reno uh, trying to intercept tourists on the way to San Francisco and the pageant of the Pacific exhibition there on uh, Treasure Island. And it has the various Art Deco motifs, which I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. Uh, the United States in the 20s, we think of it as the Roaring Twenties. The country is booming. Uh, companies have um, a flush with income. They have large advertising budgets. They can hire innovative commercial artists to sell products, as I think you can see in this uh, illustration here. And so everything is really set for an explosion of uh, the genre of pictorial maps. Great interest in graphics and advertising. Um, and from really 1926, we start to see uh, uh, just a massive outpouring of uh, pictorial uh, maps. Uh, there's one or two, 1925, a bit earlier, but really 1926 is the key year, just after that Paris exposition. and. A number of the exhibits from Paris were brought over and exhibited in major museums here in the United States. So avant-garde commercial artists uh, could go to, say, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and see uh, the latest um, work coming out of Paris and could use it for their own work here in the States. Commercial. This is a really a, a genre pushed by commercial artists. We're not dealing with... Uh, the great American artists of the 20s and 30s. I think Rockwell Kent did a few commissions uh, of estates in a pictorial map genre. But almost overwhelmingly, these maps were produced by commercial artists, such as here, George Annand, in his uh, studio, in his apartment in Manhattan in the uh, 1930s. He's just um, actually got a commission and he's smoking a cigar. I had the great pleasure of meeting his daughter who's now in her 80s. She lives in Brooklyn, Mass. And she could tell me about this picture and the context for it, in fact, supplied me with the photograph. And I love it because he's at his drafting desk. And he was a perhaps a very typical um, commercial artist who did pictorial maps. He did commissions of uh, four uh, wealthy uh, New Yorkers of their estates, say on Long Island um, and in Connecticut. But he was also working with major companies like Nabisco to advertise products. Um, and um, I think that's a more general point, is that many of the artists who produce pictorial maps are turning their hands to many types of product, book jackets, book illustrations, etc., etc. In fact, um, George Annan may well have produced the first pictorial map as a book jacket. This is the period where we're shifting from embossed book jack, a book covers, to the paper wraparound jacket. And so that gives opportunity to people like Annan to produce colourful uh, book jackets. Um, the, the major American um, map publishers get involved in... Uh, pushing these maps and commissioning maps, selling maps, and here is Hagstrom's uh, catalogue of what they call decorative and historical maps. But you can see uh, two pictorial maps are framed in this room. This is basically showing how you can use pictorial maps to decorate uh, your house. Um, so by the 
late 20s, 30s, uh, into the 50s, the major map producers, map publishers in the United States are behind uh, the genre. I should say that um, the United States is really the leader in pictorial map production. Although I've mentioned Macdonald Gill, he was almost a lone artist in the UK producing this type of map, produced superb maps. Um, but really, he's one of a kind. And it's here in the United States that we see the explosion of the genre. And perhaps that's not surprising, given the, given the prosperity of the US in the 20s and even um, in the 30s and then post-Second post World War, um, and the great attention to advertising, and of course, the importance of American popular culture. These maps are a form of uh, American popular culture. And I think because of that, they've not been treated very seriously um, until perhaps I got going with them. Uh, maybe they still won't be treated seriously. Who knows? I've not had any scholarly reviews of the book yet, but um, uh, they haven't been treated seriously. And I think that perhaps reflects their um, in, in, um, um, embodiment of uh, an aspect of American popular culture. But as I think we all are aware, American popular culture just uh, takes over much of the Western world from the 20s onwards. Think of Hollywood and, as we shall see, Disney. Um, and it is still very dominant today. So I think no surprise to find this genre so well um, developed uh, here in the US. Now, I've mentioned that these maps were not taken seriously um, by the academics and scholars. I certainly never came across them in, in my geographical uh, training. And it's really thanks to these two women about whom I know very little, uh, Ethel Fair on the left and Muriel Parry on the right. Uh, and these two uh, ladies, uh, both librarians, um, collected maps, these pictorial maps, when they were really, I think, unfashionable. Ethel Fair, remarkably, was collecting back in the 30s. Uh, she actually has an article in the Wilson Journal for Librarians from the 1930s about her collection. So even then, it was recognized that she'd put together uh, an extraordinary collection of these maps. Muriel Parry is more Second World War, post-war. Um, you see her here in the map library of the American Geographical Society when it was headquartered at that time in the 1940s in Manhattan. Um, and then she later worked as a map librarian in the State Department here in Washington. Um, and these two uh, women, uh, for whatever reason, uh, become interested in the genre. They collect them and then they donate them to the Library of uh, Congress. And it was uh, Ralph Ehrenberg who told me about these two collections. I think in total about 2,000 maps. And in a mad three days, I went through those 2,000 maps uh, looking at what they'd collected. And they really have not only a representative collection, uh, but many of the great stars of the genre. And most of the maps are in immaculate condition because they were buying them as they were being published. For those of us like myself who try to pick up some of these maps um, today, they're often in a rather battered state. So the collections we've got down in the uh, Geography and Map Division here in the Madison Building are in outstanding quality. So these two collections form the basis of the book. At least 90%, I think, of the maps in the book are based on the Fair and Parry collections. As you well know, the Library of Congress is a copyright library. However, many of these maps, because they were ephemera, essentially, were not copyrighted. And so um, the Library of Congress does not have a comprehensive collection of pictorial maps. Um, certainly the Fair and Parry collections are uh, outstanding. But the Library of Congress, unlike perhaps books, does not have everything that was published. And so I looked elsewhere, the American Geogra Geographical Society Library in Milwaukee, um, the Los Angeles Public Library, uh, the Boston Public Library, uh, the Newbury Library in Chicago, uh, and found a few maps that and don't appear to be in the LOC uh, collection. But as I say, the, ba the, the foundation of the research was here in the Geography and Map collection, and I'm most grateful that these two women 
um, put these collections together. And another point to make here is that women play a very important role as creators, as graphic designers in this genre. Um, and I'll mention one or two women as I go through examples. Um, and that's perhaps not surprising, given we're talking about the 20s, 30s, 40s, even into the 50s, where a traditional um, employment for women uh, was as uh, teachers and as librarians. And so they would be interested in communication, in educating, particularly to children. And so naturally, I think, they uh, found the pictorial map a format uh, of great interest and become creators of pictorial maps. Well, as I say, there were 2,000 maps in, the, uh, in the, uh, the two collections and many more maps I found elsewhere. And so the challenge was to create some kind of order. So I essentially created five categories, which I'm going to go through uh, rapidly um, to give you a sense of the breadth and the creativity and the vitality of the pictorial map genre. Um, I've mentioned Disney, and Disney, uh, Walt Disney, gets into the genre very early uh, with this Mickey Mouse map of the United States that was produced as a map that was folded up in a pencil case that was distributed to school, school children across the United States. You can imagine the millions of boxes of pencils with this map rolled up, and what an extraordinary way to... Uh, I get Mickey and Goofy and Donald uh, into children's minds. They didn't even need to see the cartoons. Um, they could just uh, see it on a pictorial map. Uh, and this is just the beginnings of Disney's involvement. So this is what I call maps to amuse. So this is one example. Um, uh, the Lindgren family of Spokane, Washington State, um, during the Depression, uh, decided to... Um, create smiles on people's faces and also perhaps make a bit of money by creating pictorial maps of Western National Parks. They were very successful. There's an example here of um, Yellowstone and, and uh, Jackson Hole. And after the end of the Second World War, they got into the decal market and produced, I think they became the leading decal manufacturer and producer. And so we've got a decal on the right showing the simplification of the map on the left. Um, and so if you were a tourist to one of those great national parks, you could pick up a decal and put it uh, in your car window. Um, and that, of course, was very popular uh, for, for many decades and perhaps collect these decals as well. Um, and then the phenomenon of the Bragg map. Uh, you've perhaps all seen that famous New Yorker cover of the, the view from Manhattan and how the world kind of just falls away beyond uh, Manhattan Island uh, and the center of the universe is, is Manhattan. Um, and so showing a very uh, narrow view, perhaps, or perspective of uh, average New Yorker. Well, that type of map uh, is not just confined to New York City, but is found uh, across the country. And the usual suspects here is the Texan view and uh, I hardly need to say anything about it, except Texas, um, as you can see, protrudes into Canada, which, according to my geographical training, is not the case. Um, so we get these brag maps being produced to boost a particular states or, or cities. Los Angeles and Florida, New York are um, in, involved in this. So the various types of maps to amuse, to create a chuckle or put a smile on someone's face. Then there's a second category, which are maps with a didactic function, maps to educate. And here is a publicity blurb uh, for picture history maps from the Graphic History Association based in New York. And notice designed by Elizabeth Shirtliff. Uh, she produced several wonderful pictorial maps, but I found almost nothing about uh, Elizabeth Shirtliff. I wish... Um, um, perhaps the family might still have an archive. Uh, one of the challenges of this work was not only, uh, it was one thing to find the maps, the second thing was to find the archives about the artists. Uh, I had some strokes of good fortune, but then there are other artists such as Shirtliff I could find very little about. Um, but she was interested in producing maps to educate particularly uh, children. 
And so we get this kind of map being produced. This is by actually an English expatriate, um, Ernest Clegg, who came to the United States after the end of the First World War. He was a military officer. Uh, his maps are distinguished by very fine uh, calligraphy. Um, and this is a map produced or published by Washington's National Cathedral in honor of an anniversary of George Washington. And it's, uh, if you look at it, a very splendidly designed map. But clearly, this is not a map to amuse. This is a map to educate about George Washington. And there are a number of maps of American presidents and uh, great men and women as well that are produced. Um, a map uh, produced by uh, another woman, Emma Bourne, in 1940. America, a nation of one people from many countries, published by the Council Against, Intol Against Intolerance in America. Uh, this map, uh, I am fortunate to have a copy of this map, and it was put on an exhibit at the Ocean Map Library at the University of Southern Maine in Portland. And I was told by the curator that this was one of the most popular maps in the exhibition because, of course, it resonates uh, so much with our present situation. Um, so a map in 1940 campaigning against any type of intolerance here in the United States. So clearly, again, a map with a very serious didactic purpose. And a third example is, I think, one of the, the great literary maps um, produced. This was by, produced by Edward Everett Henry for a printing company in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, this is a map that has had a certain uh, amount of publicity through the Library of Congress's exhibition and book a few years ago about literary maps. So this is reasonably well known. And of course, it's showing uh, the voyage of the Pequod and uh, Herman Melville's Moby Dick. And I just love the way Everett Henry uh, merges the sort of the two dimensions of the map form. So we have the outline of the South Atlantic and Indian Ocean into the Pacific, as well as the sort of more three dimensional imagery of the, uh, the voyage and the people involved. So a very powerful map. And there's a number of these that he produced in the late uh, 1950s, early 1960s. Then there are maps, a uh, third category of places and regions and states, and indeed of countries as well. And this is uh, by a Cleveland artist, Arthur Suki, uh, of uh, Miami and Miami Beach. Clearly, it's all about sun uh, down there. Uh, this was a map produced as a publicity piece by the Miami Herald. Um, it's, I think, quite rare to find. And it, this copy is from um, the Library of Congress. And you get that Art Deco sense of the radiant sun that he's put in the uh, bottom right corner, uh, illuminating and warming up uh, the scene. This is a map I particularly uh, enjoy. Um, and then out on the West Coast, um, a map by uh, Michael Baltical Goodman, who was at uh, Berkeley. And uh, this is, again, a 1930s map showing Berkeley and, and Oakland and San Francisco Bay. And I think um, you can see the various Art Deco tropes, the, um, the sort of chevron waves, the uh, electric winds. We often have the winds uh, from the four quarters sort of shown on medieval maps often get replicated on pictorial maps of the 20th century. And you can see in the top left that a rather electric uh, wind there with the sort of zigzags. Uh, and then there's a leaping antelope um, among the vegetation uh, back here, which is straight out of French Art Deco. So uh, a wonderfully Art Deco piece. This was actually on my first day looking at the Fair and Parry collections. I had looked at, oh, probably seven or 800 maps. I was exhausted. It was getting towards closing time at five o'clock. And the last folder for the day was brought out. And the very last map, was this one, and I thought, my goodness, this is the this is the highlight of the day. That the best has been saved for last. It is a large piece, very colourful, makes a tremendous impact to see it. Um, and I urge you to see these as objects in themselves, rather than digital imagery on the web or in this presentation, because there is a certain physicality um, and visceral reaction to them when you see them uh, as objects. 
and then this one by Vernon Farrow, uh, a glorious uh, bird's eye view of Manhattan, uh, 1926, capturing the Roaring Twenties. Uh, and finally, in terms of pride of place, a number of universities, Harvard, Cornell, and in this case, Chicago, produce maps for their alums uh, uh, celebrating their campuses. So this is the University of Chicago campus, a particularly colorful uh, campus map. Then industry got into the act. So another category is maps for industry, and uh, industry wants to advertise its services and products. So here we have the Alaska Shipping Company um, selling its uh, passenger sailings up to Alaska, Alaska from uh, Seattle. Notice the cartoon strip at the bottom. Um, again, a very cartoony map done by Joe Schull, a Western artist for Great Northern Railway, uh, advertising uh, uh, the Great Northern Service to Glacier National Park. Um, I love the bear, uh, bears confronting the tourists in the Sharon Bank there. Um, uh, the airlines got involved in the act, so this is Pan Am, the great international airline, advertising its first routes to, to Latin America. And again, we've uh, got humor here with the birds on the uh, equatorial uh, line there. And there's lots of humor in this particular piece by uh, Thompson. And then a final map for industry is very much industrial. Uh, this is a map done to celebrate the opening of the Cleveland Terminal Building in 1929. Some of you may know it if you're from Ohio. And essentially, the story is we've created this skyscraper, I believe at the time, the tallest outside of New York. Uh, come and do your business in Cleveland. Uh, we are the center of the industrial Midwest, an area we hear a lot about today, uh, the so-called Rust Belt. But here it's in all its glory, with the steam locomotives, the electric trains, the automobiles, the Great Lakes freighters, all focusing in on, on Cleveland. So it's a, a wonderful sort of advertisement for this new office complex in downtown uh, Cleveland. Then we come to the uh, Second World War. So this is uh, my fourth category. And um, we have maps for war. This is actually before Pearl Harbor. The United States feels secure behind its airplanes and, and battleships and so forth. But I want to draw your attention to this very standard Mercator map here that is used. But we're at the, on the, uh, um, the verge of the so-called air age, which is going to change cartography. As you can see here, classic air age map, as if we're looking from outer space, or at least from an airplane, looking down on the globe. Uh, this is a map by Howard Burke, um, I think for the uh, San Francisco Examiner. He also did work for the Los Angeles newspapers. And you've got a very different sense of how the world is shown cartographically. We've moved away from the Mercator projection and we've got these pictorial elements in it. And then I think the, the, the sort of the grand uh, finale are the maps produced by the federal government, the US Navy in particular, um, the um, Bureau of Naval Personnel. Uh, when I was here, I was down in the, the Navy yard. It was difficult to get into. Um, um, but to try and look at the archival papers behind the production of these maps. And I think you can see that uh, it's really an extraordinary image. And there are six of these produced for, for, for the covering the American war effort globally. And this really powerful image of, uh, sort of coming across the Atlantic uh, and engaging with uh, Nazi Germany and many types of pictorial element here. And I think you can see sort of Madison Avenue advertising behind this almost sort of cinematic image. And we know that George Anand was working for the federal government as other commercial artists to produce this kind of imagery uh, as part of the propaganda effort by the, uh, the United States. So a splendid wartime image. And then my final category, um, oh, I, I'd like just to contrast this to Macdonald Gill's map um, uh, celebrating the Atlantic Charter, the signing of the Atlantic Charter between Roosevelt and Churchill. Um, and this map gets published in 1944, the same date as the previous map. And I, can, I think you can see that 
Gill is still working with Mercator projection, really a 19th century image of empire, British empire, of sea lanes and shipping and so forth. And the US has moved into the air age here with a very different way, a very slick way of presenting uh, the world. The final category of the maps for the post-war period is a sort of catch-all. Uh, essentially, the genre is running out of steam by the 1960s, although there are still wonderful pictorial maps being produced to the present. But um, this is the last flourish, and here is an example of an air age map using the polar projection now, produced again by another woman, Sally DeLong, for a, a Western um, airline. Again, I think this is 1944, and you can see these strange beasts on the map that hark back to medieval maps. Uh, oil is, of course, central to the booming American economy of the 50s and 60s, and so here General Drafting is producing a map, a pictorial map of oil in America, just a, probably a freebie uh, uh, fold-out map you could get at gas stations. Um, the tourist agencies in various states were getting involved, so here we're out in California um, pushing um, uh, the Southland, uh, the Los Angeles area, uh, to tourists, a map produced from the 50s into the 60s. Um, Disney is thinking about um, Disneyland out in um, uh, Southern California, and to get the financial backing from the New York bankers, he creates this pictorial map he's shown with to give the bankers an idea of what it's going to look like. So the power of the pictorial image, and then a succession of pictorial maps are produced for Disneyland. This is by Sam McKim, who was one of his great graphic artists. Of course, a tremendous team of artistic talent working not just on the cartoons and the films, but producing these maps. Um, um, so Disneyland, the connection to popular culture, I think it's all, it's all here. And then um, Time Life is also gets in on the act uh, dominant American uh, news publisher. And so we've got the launch of Sputnik and Cold War tension being shown in this map by R.M. Chapin, who was the Time Life staff cartographer during the Second World War and then into the 50s and early 60s. And uh, this is just showing the beginnings of that uh, um, Cold War tension and the emerging space race. And my final map, um, to sort of summarize, uh, the genre, comes out in 1969 um, and commemorates the landing on the moon. And uh, there are many fun elements here, but notice the presidents there of Kennedy, Johnson, and, and uh, Nixon flying on the, uh, on the eagle. Um, this map was actually uh, produced from Merrill Lynch. Uh, I wondered when they gave the commission to this graphic artist whether they knew what they were getting. Um, but it's a, a very humorous take on the moon landing and in a sense picks up on that sort of 60s counterculture uh, at the time. This is a bit subversive, uh, so in a sense getting back to uh, map as uh, to amuse, map as humor. Um, by this point, the genre is, is, is pretty well over um, and uh, we, we're not getting the output uh, from, uh, that we did in the 20s and 30s, even in the 40s. But still to this day, there are graphic artists producing pictorial maps and um, uh, of, of cities. Uh, I was just down in Charleston, South Carolina um, last week and produced, uh, found a, a wonderful pictorial map produced by a ar local architectural firm of the historic district. So it must have been hours of work to put it together. So there are still very creative people uh, producing this kind of map um, uh, for the general public and uh, seems to be still alive and well. Thank you. Very happy to take some questions. Yes. Yeah, there was a fee involved, and um, 
I've looked at some of the uh, paperwork on this, and two copies had to be sent to the Library of Congress along with a processing fee. And I imagine that um, a number of these publications were just so ephemeral and would be given, given out as freebies that the artist just didn't think it was worth paying the, the processing fee. And so they're not in the, um, the Library of Congress collection. I think it's, that's the reason. Yes. I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I think there are some very creative artists at work. In fact, I've just reviewed a, um, a book by a Boston-based artist. Uh, I did the review from Margot Mundi, and he goes through step by step the artistic process. And I, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember the artist's name, but he talks about all the types of commercial work he does for university campuses for business campuses, anyone who needs some sort of pictorial guide to where things are. You can imagine it could be done here for the hill area, uh, the location of the different buildings. It would be a wonderful way of uh, showing Washington. And in fact, in the 20s and 30s, there were maps, and indeed into the 40s and 50s, there were pictorial maps done of DC, of the Marl area. It was just a, a natural for a creative artist. Um, to show the great landmarks. And in fact, Olson and Blake, who did the map of Boston, um, did three maps for Houghton Mifflin, and their third map was of Washington, D.C., that was, a copy was presented to the uh, White House, and Calvin Coolidge uh, replied very graciously, or at least his staffer did. And fortunately, the Houghton Mifflin archives are in one of the Harvard libraries, and so you could see all of this correspondence. Um, but I think there are still very creative people who are producing these maps, but not in the quantity that we saw in the 20s and 30s. Thank you. Yes. Are you going to see any on Antiques Roadshow that are, you know, co anything in the collectible yeah. realm that you've maybe got your own or looking for maybe? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the Probably the the greatest private collection is that of David Rumsey out in San Francisco. He's really given much of his collection to Stanford now. And he, um, after I'd really done this book, he started to collect. And within the space of just a few years, got at least 2,000 maps, which he then had scanned or on the David Rumsey map site, which is really a go-to place to go um, to see maps. Um, so Rumsey got involved. Uh, there are other serious collectors. Um, and there are a few map dealers that are specializing in the genre. Uh, I was actually giving a presentation on these maps at the Miami International Map Fair back in February of this year, and the comment was, no one's really interested in the old maps anymore, everybody wants the 20th century pictorials. Uh, and so the dealers are moving into it and cultivating a market, and uh, there are now collectors who are putting together collections. So it is a, a, a very um, exciting, uh, vibrant area of collection. Is there one out there that, every, that, that you know people uh, that are I, looking for? I mean, the Faro map of Manhattan from 1926 is now going for several thousand dollars. Um, there's a map of Peiping, as it was then called, Peking. And I think because of the Chinese market, that's going for four or $5,000. We're still not into the kind of prices you'd get for a, maybe a very fine 17th century map. I don't collect those type of maps. Um, but the prices are certainly rising, which is reflecting uh, the market. Uh, I actually put together a reasonable collection as a research collection um, because there wasn't a library. I couldn't being up in Maine, I couldn't get down to the Library of Congress uh, every week uh, to look at the collections. So I purchased um, some maps for my own research, uh, and I'm glad I did it four or five years ago and not now. So yes, it is a, a growing area of, of collection. Yes? And what criteria do you use to distinguish between Great. art and just the placemats that we see as Great. Great question. 
Yes, yeah. I, I resisted putting a placemat in, but maybe I should have done. <laughs> um, what I wanted to do with the book was to give the, in a sense, the greatest highlights, as well as a representation of the variety and diversity of the genre. So there are maps in the book that are relatively easy to find, uh, maps produced by the, the oil companies, for example, or by Disney. These are maps that some of you may well have kicking around at home. So they've vi got very little intrinsic value, but they are producing and showing a pictorial image of the Earth's surface. But I also wanted to show the maps, such as the Vernon Farrow map of Manhattan, which are really quite rare and are splendid examples of artistic endeavor. It must have taken hours of work to have created that three-dimensional image of the skyscrapers of, of Manhattan. So that's what I wanted to do, show the, some of the great maps that are in, particularly in the Fair and Parry collections, as well as the everyday type of map that you'd have in your, in your <coughs> car or back home. So that was the, the kind of criteria. A lot of it, of course, I was dealing with 2,000 maps in the Fair and Parry, and clearly I had to make a selection, and that inevitably comes down to one's eye and interest and what you learn about these maps over time. And you appreciate them. The more research you do, you start to realize, well, this is a key map. So, for example, the, the map of Boston I showed you that Houghton Mifflin produced, that's about as early... I mean, there was one of New York in 1925, but the one of Boston done, published by Houghton Mifflin is really almost the first map. So that has to kind of go in. And you've got to talk about the Houghton Mifflin maps, and there's a number of them in the book, and then other publishers as well. So there are things you've got to sort of sort out and make part of the narrative. So you really feel that that copied Gill, and so that yeah. was really the beginning. You can see how clearly, I mean, they're not just making this up out of their heads. They've, they've looked at that Gill Wonderground map. But what happens is that, although Gill might be an impetus, there are many other influences coming in, such as Art Deco. I wouldn't say that Gill, I mean, there are some Art Deco ele elements in later Gill maps, but I mean, it just takes off here in the United States and, and creates its own momentum. And they don't need, these commercial artists don't need to look to the UK or to, French artists. It becomes an American genre. And this is something I argue strongly in the book, that this is a, a phenomenon of American popular culture. Um, and the greatest achievements, I think, are done here in the United States. Yes? Have you done any uh, similar research in the Asian pictorial maps or any comparison of them? Yes, that's a, that's a, a great question. And there are certainly... Um, uh, maps coming up out of Japan, for example. Um, I am not an Asian specialist. Um, so, uh, and I wanted to keep this restricted to the United States. Um, but there are certainly are uh, uh, woodblock uh, maps coming out of Japan that I'm aware of, and particularly associated with the, the 1930s and the, uh, the Second World War. Um, interestingly, um, Muriel Parry, as I mentioned, was a librarian at the State Department, and she was posted overseas, in fact, to Japan after the uh, end of the Second World War. And what distinguishes her collection from Ethel Fair's collection, Ethel Fair's collection is primarily, almost entirely American maps, is that Muriel Parry collected across the globe. So there's maps from every continent, um, perhaps except Antarctica, um, but maps from Africa, um, Australasia, uh, South Asia, etc., Latin America, South, Amer South America. And so I got a sense, looking at her maps, probably about 900 of them, of what other countries were producing. And I think if there was a sort of a great um, group of maps, say from Japan or China, she would probably have got her hands on them. Um, and I think there are some Japanese maps in the collection. And so it was the sort of the looking at her the diversity of her collection that I began to realize that in fact the United States was a leader in this genre. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.